talk is recorded and will be available online later so you can watch it again if you like or you can share it. So I hope you've made yourself comfortable because I have the great pleasure now of introducing you to our speaker today, Susan Snell, archivist and records manager at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Susan will be giving us a talk about Loveless Overton and give us a view into a fascinating life of a black Freemason from Barbados. And we're looking so much forward to this. So Susan, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Jane, for that warm welcome. Well, hello, everybody. I know that there are people joining us worldwide. And I'd also like to give a special thank you this evening to all my lovely friends who are joining us neighbours, colleagues, and also um, researchers, because we have a number of researchers as well who are joining us from wherever you are. You're very welcome. And I look very much forward to telling you more about Loveless Overton. In 2006, the museum catalogued over 800 letters relating to Freemasonry in the Caribbean and colonial America. The letters include details about the origins of Prince Hall Masonry in the States and the development of Freemasonry in the West Indies. Sent to Grand Lodge from the mid 1700s to the 1880s, the letters provide details about Freemasonry, family relationships, and local events. Several items were included in an exhibition squaring the triangle, Freemasonry and anti-slavery, commemorating the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade. My friend Bernadette Hawkes helped to check my text for this groundbreaking display, which illustrated how slavery and abolitionism affected Freemasonry. Freemasonry developed during the 18th century as a charitable and social organisation within a guiding framework based on integrity, friendship, respect and charity. Freemasons encouraged equality of membership and met in groups called lodges and chapters. They followed rules in a book of constitution and aimed to welcome members from all backgrounds, supporting members as individuals and helping them make a positive contribution to society. Throughout the British Empire, men joined Freemasonry overseas or went to lodges after arriving in Britain. Some met in traveling military lodges or in colonial outposts. It can be difficult to identify local members joining colonial lodges or men from overseas joining lodges in England and Wales. As Grand Lodge registers do not record members' religious beliefs or ethnic origins. The exhibition included a letter mentioning Loveless Overton. Initiated as a Freemason in a lodge on the south coast of England in 1807. Almost 20 years later, James Cummins, an official in Barbados, wrote to Grand Lodge in a panic, seeking advice about Loveless Overton, a black man sometime past, applied to visit a lodge on this island. The letter includes a copy of Loveless Overton's membership certificate signed by the Master and Wardens of Royal Clarence Lodge, Brighton. Cummings asked Grand Lodge to check Loveless's membership qualifications, but the text reveals how members of the free black community were challenging the status quo in Barbados. This letter inspired my journey with numerous twists and turns to investigate the fascinating life of Loveless Overton. It prompted several questions. Who was Loveless Overton, who sometimes spelt Lovelace or Overton and various other ways? Why was he in England? How did he join Freemasonry? What happened when he returned to Barbados? 
Where did he go after that? And how did Freemasonry's ideals about a universal organization work in practice? My presentation aims to answer some of these questions. The first step involved checking the membership register, where I discovered Lovelace Overton, a trumpeter in the first King's Dragoon Guards, initiated in 1807. Other first King's Dragoon Guards and military personnel joined alongside Lovelace. The membership register and annual returns sent to Grand Lodge by the Lodge in Brighton do not record members' ethnicity or birthplaces. This one surviving letter in the museum's archives provided a key to unraveling Lovelace's remarkable life story. The subscription book deposited at East Sussex Record Office lists Lovelace paying fees as a lodge member for two years. At one point, Trumpeter Overton owed four shillings. However, Lovelace made seven quarterly payments to midsummer 1808, indicating he could afford to join a lodge and attend lodge meetings in Brighton. As well as, well as military men from the barracks, local butchers, school teachers and tradesmen joined this lodge. The thriving numbers indicate local prosperity. The lodge successful in attracting members with cosmopolitan views and welcoming individuals from all backgrounds. Records at the National Archives provide details for Lovelace's military career. Born in St Thomas's Parish, Barbados, Overton travelled to England and joined the Ayrshire Fencibles. This militia cavalry troop defended Britain during the French Revolution and recruited in London in the mid 1790s. Disbanded in 1800 as the threat of invasion reduced, Lovelace transferred to the King, first King's Dragoon Guards in Manchester with another trumpeter, Archibald Robertson from St George's, Grenada. Bands of black musicians in army regiments were popular and well regarded by commanding officers. Lovelace is not unique. Over 200 black soldiers served in the British Army before 1840 and several joined Freemasonry. Two black American born percussionists in regimental bands, James Fraser and Joseph Rapier, were initiated in London lodges. A West Indian drummer, William Fifield, joined a lodge near Newcastle after initiation in an Irish lodge formed in the Royal Scots Guards. As well as playing morale boosting marching tunes, military bandsmen were responsible for discipline. While regimental muster rolls and pay books at the National Archives reveal where Lovelace was stationed in the British Isles, information about his personal life appears in parish registers. Bands were read at King's Lynn, Norfolk, but a planned marriage to Mary Melinda did not take place in 1797. Perhaps Lovelace moved on at short notice with the Fencibles, which prevented a wedding. Four years later, Lovelace met a Birmingham woman, Elizabeth Tinson, and the couple married in July 1801. The first King's Dragoon Guards were stationed in Brighton by 1805. The couple set up home in the town and their son William was buried at St Peter's Church in 1807. The same year, a daughter, Charlotte, was baptised at St Nicholas's Church. Lovelace's wife, Elizabeth, had died before Charlotte married James Hunter at Preston Parish Church in 1831. After James's death, Charlotte remarried a Brighton tailor, Henry Soper, and then George Marshall, a Brighton shoemaker. Charlotte did not have any children herself, but raised a stepson before her death 
in 1856. Meanwhile, Lovelace moved on with the first King's Dragoon Guards to barracks in Manchester, Perth in Scotland and elsewhere. By 1813, he was at Mallow, Ireland, where his portrait was painted by an Irish artist, Joseph Samuel Allpenny, later known as Halfpenny. Exhibited in Dublin, I'm still trying to discover the present location for this artwork if it survives. Lovelace's uniform as a trumpeter resembled that worn by a horse guard's trumpeter. Lovelace earned one shilling and sixpence a day in this role, more than a private, but he paid for his own uniform. Lovelace was proud of his finery, which was to cause him problems on his return to Barbados. Army discharge papers reveal that in 1814, Lovelace burst a blood vessel while settling local unrest in Ireland, causing shortness of breath. This explains why Lovelace did not serve alongside the first the King's Dragoon Guards at Waterloo, where several black soldiers took part in the campaign. Between 1815 and 1816, he was one of four trumpeters from Dawson Damer's troop at the Depot Hospital in Ipswich and then Northampton. The troop marched north to Liverpool, but Lovelace sailed back home to Barbados on leave in February 1817, where his life took a dramatic turn. While visiting his sister in Bridgetown, Lovelace saw a white man beating a black slave. Without considering the local environment, the trumpeter intervened and protested about this mistreatment. He was hauled before the local magistrates and was jailed, despite the white slave owner seeking his release. News reached Lieutenant Kell, serving with the 2nd Foot Regiment on Barbados, who knew the trumpeter from Ireland. Kell and friends raised bail money to release Lovelace, totaling £250, the modern equivalent of over £7,000. After his release, the trumpeter visited the Bajan countryside with friends on horseback while wearing his uniform. The local authorities considered Lovelace, a free man of colour, able to ride a horse and wearing an elaborate uniform a threat. Local tensions were high after Bussa's rebellion the year before, when 400 slaves were defeated by the colonial militia. Although the British Parliament tried to improve conditions for Caribbean slaves, the Barbados House of Assembly rejected the draft legislation. Enslaved Barbadians who believed the proposed legislation was preparing the island for emancipation took action when freedom did not result. The letter to Grand Lodge indicates that the trumpeter, a registered Freemason, applied to visit a lodge on the island at this time, but was refused permission. Lovelace was suspected of inciting rebellion as a Haitian spy. He was re-arrested and was sent to jail by the magistrates, including Mr Oxley, a member of the island's Albion Lodge. And here I am visiting the second meeting venue of Albion Lodge in Bridgetown. Unfortunately, the uh, first meeting room on the island was um, flattened and is now underneath the bus station. But this is where, this is how the building might have looked um, that Lovelace visited. Um, Lovelace was able to prove that he was a free man but his travelling trunk was searched for incriminating papers. The authorities objected to his apparel, which they described as officer's clothing. Lovelace was placed on board a ship back to England and left the island in March 1817. After his return to England, Captain Elton helped the trumpeter, who could not read or write, 
dictator letter from the Manchester barracks to the first King's Dragoon Guards commanding officer. This survives among papers about Lovelace's case in colonial office records at the National Archives. Lovelace complained about his treatment on Barbados and wanted to restore his good reputation. He explained the events arose due to his unfamiliarity with island behaviour since leaving Barbados 24 years before. He reported that news of his case spread widely and caused a great sensation amongst the slaves who now seemed to think the magistrates had reason for what they did. And I was repeatedly warned by people of colour that my life was in danger. Details about Lovelace's mistreatment on Barbados was escalated up the army chain of command to the Duke of York's barracks in London, and Lovelace's good reputation was restored. No longer able to blow a trumpet, Lovelace was discharged from the 1st King's Dragoon Guards in December 1818. He was 38 years old, a commanding figure at six feet tall, with black hair, black eyes, black complexion, and by trade, a joiner. The Bajan, often a short form of, for somebody who comes from Barbados, who gained respect and a degree of equality through army service, continued to travel with the 1st King's Dragoon Guards as the commanding officer's personal servant. When the regiment landed in Liverpool from Ireland in 1822, Lovelace returned again to Barbados, perhaps intending to retire in his birthplace. Lovelace again contacted the Freemasons, seeking to obtain a warrant to form a new lodge for black men on the island. Stating that this might injure Freemasonry, Cummings discouraged Overton. The former trumpeter applied to the provincial Grand Master for a petition to form a new lodge, but was refused. Cummings wrote to Grand Lodge, asking them not to send a warrant, and the Grand Secretary responded with care, stating that any petition for a new warrant required agreement from the provincial Grand Master. Lovelace had other reasons for returning to Barbados. In February 1824, he signed a letter with other free men printed in the Barbadian Gazette. The letter supported a loyal address, seeking greater equality and rights sent to the governor a year before, signed by almost 400 free men on the island. In addition, Lovelace registered a slave as his property. The authorities allowed Will Bob, aged 30, to be listed alongside a female slave regis registered previously by Overton. It was not unusual for free black men or women to own slaves on the island. Lovelace may have registered the unknown woman and Bill Will Bob to protect enslaved friends or relatives. The registration of enslaved people in the Caribbean enabled owners to be compensated after the Slavery Abolition Act was passed in 1833. Perhaps disenchanted by his experiences, Lovelace decided to return to England. Although the island's free black community achieved some improvements, the lack of progress was frustrated. Was frustrating. Lovelace rejoined the first King's Dragoon Guards, caring for the commanding officer's belongings. Lovelace's striking figure can be seen bottom left. He's behind uh, the lady with the baby in the foreground and speaking to a woman with a bonnet. So this is a painting of the regimental baggage train outside St. Nicholas's Church at Newcastle upon Tyne, made in 1824. At this point, Lovelace's life took yet another unusual turn. Travelling with the regiment to Ireland, 
Loveless married Jane Jones at St Mary's Church, Dublin, where the couple settled in April 1825. Loveless described as a man of colour who resides in this town, informed Dublin, Dublin magistrates about two ships from Bermuda that had arrived in 1828. With the help of local Quakers and a local anti-slavery group, Lovelace ensured 11 enslaved crew members were interviewed by the authorities. Lovelace knew that the sailors could claim freedom by stepping on British soil. Three young men, Joshua Edwards, Robert Edwards and Joseph Rollin, say they wanted to remain in Ireland. Local anti-slavery society members tried to find them jobs on Dublin steamboats and other ships. The nine other sailors wished to return to their families and friends in Bermuda, explaining that slavery in the British dependency was less harsh than in the West Indies. Two years later, Loveless, described as a respectable looking man of colour resident in this town, spoke at an anti-slavery meeting in Belfast. A newspaper reporter described the freeborn lovers' experiences of prejudice. His treatment on Barbados included being asked to leave a Bridgetown church for sitting in a pew. Mentioning details of his arrest, the trumpeter explained that 40 magistrates questioned why he was wearing spurs and a military uniform as such dress was offensive to the island. General Steele from the island's military supported Loveless, explaining that the soldier received six months leaves due to his good character and warned the magistrates to be cautious of the consequences. Loveless also described seeing his countrymen sold and whipped for the slightest offence, supporting an end to slavery as much as the enthusiastic audience. Lovelace also spoke from the platform when the Belfast branch of the Hibernian Negroes Friends Society was formed in 1831. Audience members sent a petition to Parliament seeking to reduce taxes on East Indies sugar, but increasing those on West Indies sugar, and sent a loyal address to the Queen seeking the abolition of slavery. At this point, Lovelace's story remains unknown, but more details about this remarkable man may emerge from other archives. Born in Barbados, Lovelace achieved unanticipated levels of equality as a Freemason and respect as a serving soldier. Treated with suspicion for challenging the status quo, in Barbados, Lovelace returned to Ireland where he blessed God there was no difference between black and white while speaking as an anti-slavery activist at public meetings. Gaining a reputation in the army for good conduct and respectability in Dublin, Lovelace challenged injustices and tried to improve the situation for those less fortunate. I would like to thank um, several people who have helped put the various pieces of the jigsaw of Loveless Overton's life back together. And I'd like to thank Andy Grant in Brighton, John Ellis, who's now found details for over 200 men of colour in the army and is now working on Navy personnel. Sean Creighton, a champion of researching British black history, and Alison Ramsey, a Barbadian academic. A remarkable Freemason with charisma and self-confidence, an activist who is prepared to challenge situations despite personal risk. The truth of Loveless Overton's life is stranger than fiction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. I'll just do this on behalf of everyone. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic talk. <laughs>
Um, Susan, um, I'm, I'm already beginning to get a few questions in on the chat, actually. Oh, but, um, as I think we also better give people just a bit of time to write and, and to type as well, uh, but do keep them coming. Um, I was thinking, Susan, maybe I could kick off the questions because there's one thing that would be quite interesting to, to hear from you. Um, because I think listening to this talk, there's so much research, there's so much work gone into it. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about how and, and why you first became interested in Loveless and his life. Where, where did you first come across him? Well, it was really planning uh, the exhibition um, for the 200th, commemorating the 200th um, abolition of, um, well, the anti-slavery legislation in Britain. Um, that we did in 2007 and his life captured me because he was the first black Freemason of that sort of time that I had found. Since that time I've now found uh, several other um, early black and Asian Freemasons. Ah, very interesting. Uh, I got one here on, on the chat, Susan. Um, do we know his date of birth or his date of death? Is his grave known? Um, for the first question, uh, about his date of birth, on his army discharge um, papers, he's aged 38 or 39. So we know that he has an approximate date of birth for about 1780. I have been to Barbados and tried to find the details in the archives there. But sadly, um, the records uh, are very few and far between for that date period. But it may yet emerge, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of his date of death, that's when the story ends. We know at the moment that he was in Dublin and Belfast in about 1830, but we haven't yet found um, any details of a death for him and anybody who is doing uh, family history in either Northern Ireland or Ireland will know how difficult it is including my parents-in-law to find any surviving records so sadly again we still don't know what happened to him after 1830. Mm. Um, is there any record of lodge visits in the various places he served in Britain and Ireland? We haven't found him joining another lodge in England or Scotland or Ireland because the records membership registers of the Grand Lodge of Ireland are now available on Ancestry alongside our own. Um, I have checked to see and haven't found him yet but um, his name is written in various archives in slightly different ways so for example he's either love less or love lace in parish or military records and his daughter um, provided his name as Loviton or Loviton in her marriage um, papers when she got married when she had to give the name of her father so although it seems quite not that unusual a surname you when searching for details you have to look at various variants um, but gradually um, we're beginning to find out more and in those newspaper cuttings, for example, from uh, Belfast and Dublin, his O.V. Ton is the surname. Aha, uh -huh. that is interesting. I'll just mention again, if you have a question for Susan, please use the chat function. That's what we're keeping an eye on. Um, Susan, you, you mentioned there the different ways his name was spelled um, and you also said he, he couldn't read and write. Do we know if he kept in touch with his family back in Barbados and if so how? That's a very good question. Um, he certainly had a sister in Bridgetown with whom he kept in contact and the fact that he registered two people um, as slaves in the island would suggest that those were friends or relatives. 
I think, as in the case when he dictated a letter that somebody else um, made sure was forwarded up the chain of command um, to the army people at the uh, Duke of York's barracks in London, um, I think he would have dictated letters. Um, other soldiers would do that. It was a way of gaining a little bit more income. And that's how he probably kept in contact. Mm. Uh, speaking of Barbados, there's a question here in the chat. Did Lovelace go back to Barbados after being married? He, after his first marriage, yes, um, because I suspect that his wife died um, fairly early on. I, I can't find any more details about Elizabeth and what happened to her in Brighton. Um, so I suspect, yes, he went back to Barbados in 1817 and then again in 1822, 1823. Right. Um, do we know where did he, his daughter live? His daughter Charlotte lived in Brighton and she is included in the census returns for 1841 and possibly 1851 as well before she dies. Um, she doesn't seem to have been very lucky in love because she married on three occasions and she looked after a stepson, we know, but um, she didn't have children herself. Okay. Uh, but we don't know, of course, if no? Loveless had children with his second wife, Jane, in Ireland, and it would be very interesting. That Again, is... the records are very difficult to yeah. find, yeah. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. Uh, broadening it out a bit, Susan, is it possible that there are records for the rest of the West Indies, Sierra Leone, or Nigeria, and the rest of Africa, perhaps? Yes, um, in the historical correspondence, we have correspondence relating to the West Indies, and we also have um, correspondence re relating to Sierra Leone, um, Nigeria, and other places in Africa and South Africa. Um, so wherever Freemasonry went under the United Grand Lodge of England, we do have some correspondence. It's not all catalogued yet, but you can contact us and then we can make it available for research. Mm -hmm. Did Lovelace had to pay for being released from slavery? He himself was a free man, and we know he had a certificate to prove that because he mentions that uh, when he was arrested uh, in Barbados that they searched his trunk and he was able to prove that he was a free man. And he's very proud of that status. Yeah. Why actually, Susan, why, why did he become a Freemason? That's a very good question, Jane, and perhaps we will never know, but um, we know that he went along to the Royal Clarence Lodge in Brighton and was initiated at the same time as two other men, and he wasn't... Uh, as far as we know, treated any differently. We know because there are newspaper references to black trumpeters at the barracks in Brighton. And I think he was a man of charisma. A mm. lot of people knew him. A lot of people respected him. The fact that he was granted six months leave uh, on two occasions means that he was considered to have good conduct and great respect amongst his fellow soldiers. So he would have gone along alongside anybody else and uh, was initiated, passed and raised as a Freemason in that lodge in Brighton. Mm -hmm, interesting. When Loveless was uh, discharged, how did he maintain his living? Um, we're not sure. We think initially he was the servant of the commanding officer, <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel Teasdale, and in the baggage train, 
there are some boxes that have got Teasdale's name in the baggage train, train painting. There are some boxes with Teasdale's um, name on them. And so he would have been responsible for packing up Teasdale's um, personal belongings, looking after them, making sure that they leave and arrive in the right place at the right time on the, the baggage trains. Um, it's possible when he was in um, Ireland that he um, was um, a joiner because he had a trade uh, when he was in the army and it's possible that he was making furniture. We don't know, but that's something else, uh, perhaps for asking uh, any local mm -hmm. uh, historians in Ireland to go and find out. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, Susan, when did the army stop recruiting black uh, um, musicians? Um, when and why? Well, black army bandsmen were very popular and there are drawings of guards um, and Dickens actually mentions seeing the uh, Turkish percussion, as they called it, of these bandsmen in the streets of London. But um, there is a very good history of the guards regiments that mentions that after about 1840, uh, it seems that uh, the recruiting of um, black guardsmen and musicians was discouraged. Right. There is an interesting one here in the chat, Susan. Uh, I'm just going to read it out. My grandfather was part of the Scottish Freemasons in Nigeria in the early 1900s. I presume they have their own records. Yes, and uh, anybody with uh, members who joined Scottish lodges, which weren't just in Scotland, but worked all over the world, um, where Freemasonry travelled, and you will often find lodges meeting under the Grand Lodge of England and the Grand Lodge of Scotland and even the Grand Lodge of Ireland in Africa and elsewhere. In fact, in Barbados, there are lodges meeting under all three uh, groups of Freemasonry and also a Prince Hall Lodge as well. Um, but in order to find details about members, uh, anybody interested interested will um, need to contact the Grand Lodge of Scotland and some of you may have seen Hugh Quash's um, Who Do You Think You Are program and it showed some photographs of his ancestors uh, in regalia of uh, a Scottish lodge so um, they were members of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Another one on the chat, Susan. Um, was he initiated in a lodge of ancients or moderns? Um, he was initiated in a moderns lodge in Brighton. We know that. We know that. Uh, Susan, could you tell us a bit about what happened to those three men that was freed as a result of Lovelace's, uh, well, it, it was a direct intervention, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Um, they dis these three men decided to remain in Ireland and again, I would like to work with some local researchers to see if we can find out about them um, because that would be great. Yeah. You don't know what happened to them? No, not yet, not yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Susan, we are running out of time. There is a good one here. I think it could be interesting to end on actually. Do you have any details of his parents? Very good question. I have found um, details of somebody in Barbados who might be his mother um, but didn't find any details of a father um, but the records again are so sparse and difficult to confirm um, but yes I have found a Mrs Overton in Barbados who might be his mother. Yeah. Aha that is very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to mention, Jane, because um, I have now found details for several other early Black and Asian Freemasons. And one of the early Asian Freemasons was also in Brighton. He's the chap who set up the Turkish baths in Brighton. 
and oh, uh, right. yes it's quite an interesting man but I'm now close on the heels of another Freemason who came from Suriname he was actually born in Suriname and we know who his father was he was captured on a ship by the British went to St Helena and then was taken back in a convoy of ships to England he's in London where he marries and he runs a pub which is still there in Wigmore Street in Marylebone and um, he joined first an ancients lodge but they wouldn't have him or he joined and the Grand Lord didn't think um, he was a, a suitable member so he did join then a moderns lodge where he was accepted um, he had four children and the family moved to Gosport in Hampshire where he joined another uh, lodge in Gosport this is, and the man's name is Frederick Gisbert Ziegler. Um, I know that he fell on hard times and he joined the English Navy, the Royal Navy and served on board ships with the Navy and then um, his wife died and several children died and he ended up as an inn pensioner at the Royal Hospital in Greenwich uh, and he dies in 1840. So it's really only finding these traces in other records that we can then identify other early um, black and Asian members. Goodness, that's a, yeah, a lot of work. There. Susan, I'm just going to squeeze one more question in because okay. I've got one here a few times. Do you know what happened to his slaves after he came back to England? That's a very good question. And again, we need to do more research in the compensation registers to see if Lovelace was, they tried to find Lovelace to give him the compensation. Um, in about 1838 so there again uh, some more research is required but if anybody finds the answer <laughs> do let me know <laughs> thank you so much susan we are running thank up you. time i'm afraid but i want to say thank you so much to susan for a fantastic talk thank you to our colleague and technical wizard louise and thank you of course to all of you for joining us tonight and for your questions. Apologies if we didn't manage to go through all of them. We got a lot, so thank you so much. I hope you found the talk interesting and that you may want to join us for another talk. We have lots of stories that we would love to share with you. I will be back next Monday, so on the 29th of June, same time, 7.30 p.m. British time, with my colleague Martin, who's the librarian at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Martin will be giving us a talk about Benjamin Franklin, and take us on a little journey into Franklin's life in Freemasonry. Please join us for that one because it's going to be a very interesting talk by Martin. Keep an eye out for the links, please. They will be available online shortly. So for now, thank you so much and have a nice evening. Thank you.